The director of the National Journalism Center discusses how his program works to improve gun reporting and how I help. That and more on this episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. All right. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Gutowski. I'm also a CNN contributor and the founder of TheReload.com, where you can head over and sign up for our free newsletter today. If you want to keep up to date with what's going on with guns in America, you can also, of course, buy a membership if you want to help support our reporting and get access to hundreds of pieces of analysis that you won't find anywhere else. You also, of course, get this show a day early and the opportunity to appear on the show in the member segment, just reply to your exclusive Sunday newsletter that you'll also get with the membership. Um, this week on the show, we are going to be talking a little bit about uh, guns and media. And one of the programs that's out there that tries to address some of the issues that are common in reporting on firearms that we see in the news industry. And so to do that, we have with us today T. Beckett Adams, who's the director of the National Journalism uh, Center over at uh, Young Marist Foundation. Uh, welcome to the show, Beckett. Appreciate Thanks, so much for having, Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Can you tell people a little bit more about what NJC is, the National Journalism Center, and uh, a little bit about your own background as well? Sure. So kind of the Reader's Digest version, the National Journalism Center uh, was founded in 1977 with a very simple sort of uh, mandate, which was to train journalists in responsible truth seeking reporting no matter uh, what the what the cost or you know which party might be affected by it and uh yeah, even more now than ever the messages um and the mandate of the program is crucial as i feel many newsrooms whether we're talking left or right uh specifically especially on the left have moved very sort of hard into these areas where um the the main thing is whether or not their reporting may hurt uh, the preferred narratives or the preferred party or candidate, et cetera, et cetera. So what we do right now is that we take take all kinds and we just train aspiring journalists, we young people who want to get into the business. And Stephen, you can probably speak to this as well. But one of the things that they don't tell you a lot about Amer uh, journalism, at least in America, uh, is the amount of gatekeeping that goes on. It's hard to get in at the ground level. It's hard to just walk in through the front door, especially when you have you know 600 other people fighting you for the same uh, job position. So one of the things we do is we take um, we take all comers, people who want to get in, and we basically help them get through the door. We we aren't the gatekeepers. We're happy to help. We're happy to network and introduce people and you kind of get them a leg up. And the main thing being that we train them to just be truth-seeking, um, uh, fearless reporters. That's really what we focus on. Now, I came to the NJC in 2022, kind of addressing what you were saying specifically about my background. Um, I am currently a three-time columnist. I write for, I write every week for the National Review, Washington Examiner, and The Hill, um, weekly columnist. Before that, I actually went through the NJC myself in 2010. And I actually, my first gig out of there, they they connected me again, back to gatekeeping. Um, they immediately connected me to a new site that needed a business reporter. So I did business reporting for a little bit, business editing. And I moved uh, to the Washington Examiner in 2014, where I started covering politics. I covered media as a media reporter, not a lot of commentary, not a lot of you know uh, opinion, just straight up, you know, Maggie Haberman uh, moves from Politico to the New York Times, just straight up news reporting. Right. And yeah. then eventually in 2016, I was uh, assigned to the Clinton campaign, which at the time I wasn't happy with because I thought it would be boring. And boy, was I wrong because there was a <laughs> lot going on. And one of the yeah. huge benefits of that campaign is so few people were paying attention. Um, it was ripe for the picking for so many scoops and original stories just because everyone was looking the other direction. Yeah. Understandably so. And then after 2016, I got into commentary. So I do a lot of opinion, uh, a lot of writing about you know, what I think is going on because I, I feel I have developed a certain expertise in certain areas, specifically media criticism. And now here we are in 2024. I train young journalists while writing three columns. Uh, some of the columns about media criticism and just some of it generally about social and cultural commentary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and NJC itself, um, you know, it's it's like an internship program primarily. It's uh, mainly college kids. Although I, I'm sure you, uh, I don't know if it's only college kids. Is it? Is it only? No, we we accept all types. I mean, it's okay. generally college students. We have um, if if they apply people in high school, but you know, that's generally an issue where parents aren't comfortable uh, letting the kids come to DC. The other thing is in person internship. So it's in DC, and like you were saying, right. um, it is an internship. It's 12 weeks long. We usually get college students. We do get college grads frequently. But, you know, 
everyone's welcome to apply and we take all kinds, but generally it's uh, collegiate folk who are looking to sort of launch their careers immediately after college. Yeah. And, and they do internships with different publications. I've worked with NJC interns both at the reload for the last several, last three years. It's almost our three year anniversary, by the way. Um, and, uh, but before that, at, at the Washington Free Beacon and um, at uh, CNS News, uh, you know, we had NJC interns that whole time. And so it's a very, uh, it's a very good program in my experience. It produces some very good uh, writers and, and reporters. Um, and so I'm, I'm happy to be able to work with you guys, uh, both as somebody who hosts interns and then also on this program we're going to talk about. Because uh, so one of the specific things that you guys do um, is uh, a, a firearms program, a firearms reporting program that we've created together, I guess, um, but that I, I run um, the training side of it. But, uh, you know, it's the goal is to teach the basics of, of reporting on firearms, try and uh, keep the students away from some of the most common mistakes you see in major media when it comes to firearms reporting um, and, and also give them actual real world experience with gun safety training and, and using a firearm in person. So uh, tell me a little bit about your, your decision-making process on why you uh, agreed to do this, this sort of program with me, why, what you thought it, uh, why you thought it was a good idea, what it brings to the program in your mind. Yeah. So like you were saying, probably the biggest thing that we do on top of uh, the sort of hands-on training that I do as an instructor and my colleague, Ellie Jashinsky, that we do as instructors is we do, like you're saying, in-person work placement. Mm -hmm. We actually put our interns in an actual you know, brick and mortar newsroom around the DC area. Free Beacon being one, Reload, you had a, one of our interns last um, uh, last summer, although technically that wasn't a brick and mortar, but you get the well, point. Yeah. And so one of the first things I did when I came on to J uh, NJC in 2022 is having covered media and done a lot of as a media as a straight news media reporter and then later as a commentator doing media criticism i came across the same sort of mistakes and the same sort of uh, like almost trends like if it's a story about a certain topic you can almost be guaranteed that there's going to be something wrong in it so i kind of as a bit of a joke you no know, says so there are three big things that you can almost set your watch to in terms of whether or not it's if they try to report on it they will get it wrong firearms, faith, and abortion. Those are, in my mind, the three main areas that no matter where you're reading, whether it's the New York Times or USA Today, chances are they're probably going to get the basics of it wrong because it happens to be, and we can talk about this for hours, but a lot of reporters at sort of corporate, legacy, mainstream, whatever word you prefer to use, a lot of reporters at some of these larger newsrooms simply just don't know a lot about certain topics, One and three being the ones that I listed. And so when I came into NJC, one of the first things I wanted to do was incorporate a sort of firearm literacy course where we could try to avoid some of the basic, very common mistakes that we see again and again. And Stephen, I know you can speak to this. It's, it, one of the things I've tried to avoid in my, my criticism or writing is that you don't want to just nitpick and be like, ha ha, mm -hmm. they said clip when they meant magazine. Like, that's not the point. Right. The thing where it starts to get frustrating is that you can point these things out a hundred times and the editors refuse to learn and refuse to get it right because you see the same problem over and over and over again. So one of the things that I, when we were putting this together, wanted to do was not just sort of beat into their heads this sort of technical language in terms of firearms, but to help them contextualize a lot about firearms, especially the AR-15. So if ever they're going to have to write about gun-related violence or Second Amendment legislation, you're not completely out of your element trying to write about, I don't even know what an AR is. I don't know what an AR looks like, let alone, I don't know anything about a bump stock. And yet your editor is asking you to write about some of this stuff. So in terms of, we try to give them just basic literacy, like, hey, here's the difference between fully automatic and semi-automatic. And by the way, you cannot get fully automatic legally in this country, like very basic stuff. And then after that, we actually take them to a range. It's 100% voluntary, of course. If people are uncomfortable, I never, we never insist upon it. Then we take them to a range where they can actually fire a firearm and many of these students fire it for the first time in their lives. They've never even touched a gun, let alone fired one. And so we have, it's funny too, because we get a lot of international students. Yeah. Uh, like last spring we had um, a gentleman from China and a gentleman from Italy never have touched a gun in their life. And the, the Italian was, uh, he had a lot of fun. But he, like, he had this moment. He was like, I get it. I understand like sports shooting now makes sense to me. This is fun. You know, that, that. So 
the idea isn't just you know trying to convert them and make people huge Second Amendment fans or huge gun nuts. The idea is if you're going to write about an AR, maybe it'd be useful if at some point you've held one, you've heard one, you can now kind of contextualize in your head what people are talking about when they talk about, say, shooting uh, shooting sprees, shooting events, et cetera, et cetera, or the legislation, the technicalities of the AR. And I kind of used this um, analogy before in the past, but imagine like being a reporter and you now are going to have to cover a basketball game. You can have someone ex- describe to you how a basketball game works, but it might be useful at some point for you to sit down and actually watch a basketball game. So that's kind of the approach that we have taken. Or and playing it, been, right? Or even playing it, right. Yeah. At the very least, you can watch it, just something, try to familiarize yourself. And so that's what we've been trying to do. This is just one of those blocks of like, here's here's an area where media frequently gets it wrong. Let's try to correct that one, you know, one young aspiring journalist at a time. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that captures the core of what we're what we're trying to do in these classes. And we just had one last Friday as uh you know, I, uh, I mentioned on the podcast I was going to go do this. And, and so I figured it'd be a good time to, you know, get it. We've been doing this for a little while now. And I know it interests a lot of people um, who subscribe to Reload. And so I want to get people a little bit deeper insight into how this works and why we're doing it. And I think you captured the real core of what I think is most important in these these range trips These and the classroom portion. is like it's not so much about teaching terminology, although that's part of it. Yeah. Right. Uh, obviously, we want to make sure they understand the difference between semi-automatic and fully automatic and try to get some of these very common mistakes that you see repeated uh, over and over again. Try to um, explain the different uh, sticking points in a lot of uh, our current gun issues that people are going to run into if they're covering this this topic uh, for for a newspaper somewhere, you know, things like the how the background check system actually works, what people mean by um, the gun show loophole, what that actually means and the critiques of, of it and and so on and so forth. Like trying to give them a better grasp on some of these basic things they're likely to come across, uh, you know, assault weapons versus assault rifle or what definition of an assault weapon is and how that varies from state to state. And, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of these things that you will hear come up uh, uh, very frequently if you're writing about guns. And I, and I do think that one of the big problems, and I think we will get into this a little bit later on sort of when we talk about media generally, but one of the big problems is that you get a lot of uh, general interest reporters who report on guns because not a lot of outlets actually have a beat reporter that focuses on this topic. And that leads to most of these kinds of problems because the reporters not only have never had training like this, like what we're, what you guys are providing at NJC and what I'm helping you with, but but also I've never spent much time writing about the issue before. Like it's right. something that gets worked out through beat reporting. Like you usually become more knowledgeable about a subject, the more you write about it. But if you don't have the industry doesn't have a focus on this topic as a serious, uh, most of the industry doesn't have a uh, focus on this topic as like a serious subject that they want to dedicate resources to. And so, you know, that, that becomes a big problem, but one way to combat that, I think the primary way to combat these things is, is through teaching information, you know, right. providing them information and providing it on a more holistic level than just AR doesn't stand for assault rifle or <laughs> magazines. Clips are different from magazines or, you know, that sort of thing that, like you said, that's it's easy to point out as a, almost a gotcha thing. Like, yes, reporters should know that if they're writing about something, but also it's not the biggest right it's more important that they understand the fundamental issues at play all right it's crazy to me that more like you're saying more newsrooms don't dedicate at least some resources to getting their reporters generally versed in this because that's the thing like i was saying like when we do range day i don't expect them to come away loving it and being big second amendment nuts or i I don't care i just want them to know what they're talking about when they write about it that's all i'm asking and the fact that we had to design and sort of invent something like this because nothing like this exists for and like it's the reason it's crazy to me is how often the fi- firearms, the Second Amendment, the stuff is in the news. It's every four years, especially for presidential elections, hot topic issue. And yet newsrooms spend the bare minimum of even that training the reporters to understand what they're writing about, even though they're going to write about this stuff all the time. Yeah. And it, it's to me, it's crazy. It's a it's a blind spot that makes you wonder at what point is it willful or is it just plain laziness? And it, the reason being it's there. It exists. So that's why. One of the first things you know, I did when I when I came on to NJC here was like, call you up and 
let's talk about how when we have these classes come through. So just real quick, we have two sessions per year, one in the spring and summer. Every year we have you know, two sessions come through. Sometimes classes are, you know, there's 10 students, sometimes there's 30 students. But the idea is every time, every fresh one comes in, they have to have some basic literacy in this issue. They will almost certainly write about at some point in their careers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I, I just think it's something where uh, dedicating some time and resources to understanding. I mean, look, if you're reporting, you should try to dedicate some time and resources to whatever you're going to be writing about. That's your responsibility as a, as a reporter. You need to know about these things if you're trying to inform your audience. If you don't know anything about the topic, then you know, your audience is going to be even more clueless when you get to write a piece. Uh, you know, that's why, you know, obviously there's, you don't have to become an expert. You can cite experts and hopefully you, you'll do it in a way that's uh, ideally you want to try and be fair to everybody in the story and, and give a, a breadth of views on the topic. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's just one of those things where I, I, and I talk about this in class, like, sure, there's a, is there an ideological bent in major media? I think you could say there is right. But, right. and, and some of that comes to play in, in any issue, including with guns, uh, the, the, a lot of major outlets tend to have left-leaning people in them. I mean, they had the NPR uh, editor who just wrote about his, the DC office has 87 Democrats and zero Republicans. Like, you know, there, there's a, it exists. I don't think it's, I think it's clear to see, um, but I don't think it's what actually drives most of the issues that we see in reporting on firearms. I honestly think it has much more to do with a lack of knowledge than it does with some sort of, attempt by reporters to manipulate stories to favor their ideology. Like, I just think for your, especially for your average, like beat reporter, your average print reporter who's writing a story. I don't think that's their goal. If they, if they're doing this professionally, um, I, I think it's much more uh, ignorance, like just lack of knowledge and which is one addressable. And it's not, it's still, I mean, they should know better, you know, I, I to be fair. Right. And this but, this points to a much larger issue, which is I think a lot of reporters, and you probably know this from experience, write with a certain amount of um uh what's the word I'm looking at? They write with a certain amount of of at ease because they know like look, if I mess something up, my editor at least, or the web producer is probably gonna catch it. And these stories just get printed, like the editor doesn't catch it, the web producers don't catch it, it goes through layers and nobody catches it. So that speaks to actually a larger issue in the newsroom, which is yeah. A lot, and I think a lot of reporters do have this where they're like, I'm writing this and I think I got it right. This is how I framed it. And I think some reporters, especially the longer they're in, they slip into this habit where like, well, if my editor didn't catch it, then I assume I got it right, uh, which is not a great assumption to ever make. Um, but it points to the issue that you see the stuff that gets to print. And you're like, how did, how many, like at the New York Times, like this went through at least three layers and nobody caught it. Yeah. So and we, I, got, we got to start at the bottom and just start, you know. You know, you can't rely on the editors or, again, the web producers to, to back you up if you make a huge error, especially if you're making these errors over and over again, where that's when it starts getting really frustrating. Yeah, and, and I definitely think it's more of an industry problem than it is like an individual newsroom or individual reporter issue. It, it's something where the industry does not value this knowledge that much, uh, honestly. Um, you know, I, I think CNN has been a little bit better than, than others on this point by at least trying to to go out and, and find people who are knowledgeable. But uh, even if they come from different perspectives, it's really to me, it's not so much about your ideological perspective on guns. That's as much of an issue like can be an issue, obviously. But it's again, it's just lack of understanding of the basics of the uh, of everything about firearms, not just how the firearms function themselves. This is something that's I think unique to our class, too, is like it's not just about, oh, here's how your the gun policy works. Right. Here's how background checks work. Here's how that law works. Uh, it also is about handling a firearm. How, here's how a firearm, how, how you should properly handle a firearm uh, and shoot it safely. Right. That's another aspect. Here's, uh, you know, gun culture. Here's here's how we actually, especially with the, the international students that come in, we, we tend to spend a lot of time talking about gun culture in America and why. Uh, it's right, because they come over. They come over understandably with many questions. Because them, it's completely not just a. I mean, not to no pun, not just a foreign concept, but to some of them, it seems insane. It seems crazy to them. Sure. And so yeah. you you get to have this chance to sort of like explain, you know, the culture behind gun culture. Yeah, not the perspective. 
the perspective of the culture and you get to have this chance. And there's some of the students are like, okay, well, thank you for explaining. It. I now understand it. I still think it's a little insane, but yeah, but I know it's not it about, doesn't seem right. 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 And it's not about them. It's not, it's, we're not there to convince them one way or the right. other. I just want them to know what they're talking yeah. about. That's all. Yeah. I and, and, and often, <laughs> Bare minimum. right. And often they, they kind of want me to tell them my opinions on, on uh, yeah. different topics and that's understandable but yeah. uh, you know, and I feel yeah. like every every session the student asks you like so how what's your plan to stop mass right. shootings right. like that yeah. happens every class yeah it's like well yeah. you know, if we had the answer to that we'd probably be very wealthy well it's it's just like there are lots of different perspectives on here's and I tried my best to represent what uh you know either side would argue on like I try to explain the positions at the play because that's what's going to be. It's not so much as a reporter what your opinion on uh, X uh, topic is. It's more about being able to, uh, uh, you know, represent fairly what each side is saying. Uh, now, you, you know, you want to obviously at a certain point, you have to report the facts of what's happening. Um, but I think it's important to acknowledge that people can look at the same set of facts and have very different opinions on what to do from that point. And it's best to try and uh, give people those opinions from either side and, and try to, you know, do them in a way that's fair and representative of what the side, each side believes on the topic. Right. And, and that's, that's more what I try to get across with what I'm teaching this class is like not so much what I think we should do to reduce gun violence. I mean, certainly I, I listen to the arguments and have my own personal opinions one way or the other, but I think it's more important to give my readers what different sides are arguing, what they think, and then people can make up their own minds. But the way that I, I feel like, I feel like that has led to some frustration on my part that I've had to try to check the feeling that I have put in more effort trying to understand, say, every town's positions and I can recite them backwards and forwards. And I don't feel that level of, um, that level of commitment is a two way street. I feel like there's a lot, cause I see common mistakes and, um, not just mistakes, but also just falsehoods pushed by a lot of different activist groups. And it's like, I don't feel like you actually took the time to sit down and learn. You just know there's something you don't like and you want it to change. And that's fine. I get that. But if we're going to have a reasonable and not just even reasonable, but a productive back and forth, or even a negotiation, like you got to know it you're talking about it's as simple as that and so we go back to the newsrooms like i can speculate all day long about why more effort isn't made to make sure reporters not even the entire newsroom but at least the people who cover this stuff aren't better um equipped to deal with to talk about it and i don't know if it's it's cultural like look they've never been in golden culture to them maybe it's embarrassing so they never bothered to learn about any of this stuff um there's an over-reliance on experts say but as you and i both know a lot of experts actually don't know what they're talking about um, it's usually someone who's like, I used to be an X branch of the military and I think he's like, okay. Yeah. But then like you, you have these moments of like, that's fine. You try to learn the arguments, but you try also try to present them. So like when I would report on these issues, whenever I would report, actually this happened a lot when I was at the examiner, people would come to me and they'd be like, you're the gun guy. I'm like, well, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not an expert or anything. And they're like, I actually don't know anything about rifles. Did, is what I wrote correct? And look it over me like, well, actually, technically you know, it's just, there you go. Fantastic. And then they would never ask again because they learned after that first time. I was like, fine. But like, I get people aren't in the culture. I get that. What I don't understand is how newsrooms can kind of continue along because it maybe it's like I was saying, it's embarrassing. They think it's like beneath them, maybe like redneck culture, whatever. I don't know that. That's all pure speculation. The point is it hurts their reporting. People won't trust them because maybe they don't put an emphasis on it, but there are millions of people out there who know what they're talking about when it comes to this. And they see you saying something like chainsaw bay and they're never going to take you're reporting seriously after that. It just becomes a gag. So I don't understand. It's self-defeating. Why not put in just a little bit of energy into making sure you don't put clown yourself like that? Yeah. And this is what we start off with the class with, right? What's the problem? Like trying to identify a problem for these students of like, why does this even matter? Why should you care? And the problem is that if you make the mis if you make significant mistakes in your reporting, uh, you know, maybe your colleagues don't recognize that it's a mistake because they're also not well informed on the issue. But some section of your readership is going to know <laughs> and they're going to stop taking you seriously. And, and it's a, and, and at this level the, with, you know, after years of this happening across the board, you get to the point where wide swaths of the country don't take the industry seriously on firearms anymore. And that's well, and certainly not going to take your, they're certainly not going to take your reporting and they're certainly not going to take your commentary seriously. So you can write 
the angriest, most impassioned piece you want on gun reform, but you get basic stuff wrong. Everyone's just kind of laughing you out of the room and just be like, you're writing from feelings. You don't actually know what you're talking about. And it's funny because I'm not, there's like two separate cultures that remind me of each other. Car, like classic car culture and gun culture are very similar in how its members sort of uh, <laughs> behave. I'm not explicitly in either one. But the point being, if you get something wrong, they will let you know very fast. You don't know what you're talking about and they will correct you and they will give you the right information. So in gun culture in the United States, broadly speaking, like there are people who actually just know uh, know and understand the basics of the firearms. And that's a lot of people. And they come across your reporting and it's clear you don't know what you're talking about. The next obvious question for them is, why am I reading this? Why should I continue reading this? If not to just make fun of it. So it's like your reporting won't be taken seriously. Your commentary certainly won't be taken seriously. So if it is that your purpose is to and achieve some level of, you know, stricter gun legislation, well, how are you going to do that when you're being laughed out of the room every time you open your mouth? So that, that's why I don't, is it laziness? Is it ignorance? Is it hubris? I don't know. All I know is it exists. And that's one thing that you and I at least are, are trying to change one semester at a time. Yeah, certainly. I mean, these are small classes, so it's not, you know, we're not, <laughs> it's not hundreds. Hey, of you know, better, it, anything bigger than zero is bigger than zero. I, so. I absolutely agree. And I, and I do feel like, um, the students come away from these classes and you, you'll know a little bit better than I do because you, you continue to interact with them after. Uh, and I don't, I don't, I'm not with them every week like you are. So, uh, but I feel like they do actually learn a, a significant amount on uh, from this course. And at least from the handling of the firearms that can usually be somewhat revelatory for, for a number of these students. Um, and, and it gives them, especially because some things like, for instance, silencers or suppressors right uh we often will have a suppressor demonstration as part of our range trip uh so that people can have like because there's a very well ingrained popular culture view of what a silencer does or suppressor does yeah and in real life that's not actually how they work and so it can be but they do have a legitimate substantial effect it's just not movie style assassin effect or john wick chapter two where they're shooting in the train station and no one notices <laughs> walking and, and nobody yeah notices. that's not how <laughs> you would know that people were shooting at each other uh, just, you, yeah you know very fast that's not how suppressors work in real life that's why people yell at you if you call them silencers uh instead of suppressors because they don't actually sense uh, you know as i explained to some of the students i have a different view on this than some gun rights activists because the guy who invented them called them silencers his company was called Silencer Co. The ATF also calls them silencers under the National Firearms Act. And of course, the largest maker today is still called Silencer Co. But I get the objection to this idea that they make around sound. It's basically just marketing. Um, and so it's, but it's good to some things like that or what, how an AT, AAR 15 actually feels to shoot in practice. Right. Those are things that. I think are good practical lessons that you're not going to get from just hearing about it in a classroom. Right. There's a certain level, especially when it comes to something like guns or I would say cars or sports. Like it is, it's one thing to just read about it, but at the very least you got to look at it. And if you can get your hands on it, that's even better. Yeah. And yeah. so the AR, I don't expect people to go out and become professional shooters, you know, uh, sports, shooters, but I would like for them to get that, that color that they can add into the stories if ever they write about it. They now know, how it how much it weighs, what it smells like, what it sounds like, what it, you know, the reverberations yeah, when you're standing next to it. It's all color that can be then incorporated into your story, and you can actually write something that's really compelling and well informed. And it's as simple as that. And I do think it is a bit of a, an indictment that we have that I feel like we had to invent this because nobody else really does it. And it's, I mean, it's, it is what it is. I would like to see a change on a national level just so we can have better informed reporting and therefore a better informed populace because you know i have many people in my life family and friends who um differ from me uh, in terms of the second amendment and gun rights and to hear a lot of the stuff that gets repeated back it's like that's not true but i've heard that about a hundred times because it's the same stuff gets recycled through right. right. no different newsrooms it's not even the same one it's not necessarily i wouldn't even say there's one newsroom that's like the worst offender i think it's all kind of equal across the board it's like it's just not great. It's a systemic issue for sure in inside the industry where, like I said, you know, earlier, it's 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 not like you can point to one particular reporter or one newsroom that's that's so much that's leading the the sort of 
ignorance charge, if that's the way you want to put it. Katie Couric, but like, you know, that was a while ago, even. Yeah, I mean, Katie Couric's that main issue with her documentary was just that they edited it uh, to be. Yeah, uh, to it wasn't be, even playing ignorance. It was just yeah, playing that, just, that's, that's <laughs> different. <laughs> that's a different. Although different that does get into together. one of the other things that I start off the class with is like, yes, one of the issues that journalists face is a lack of credibility on this topic because of continuous. Uh, mistakes often of the same basic kind, right? Like I mean, semi-automatic versus fully automatic is a pretty huge distinction that people don't understand often in newsrooms, which is um, that really gets at the level of ignorance involved. But because anyone who owns a firearm or has shot firearms should have a pretty good grasp on the difference between semi-automatic and fully automatic. <laughs> right. You, you know if you different. don't. It's, it's one of those different. situations. Um, so we get into yeah, an issue but, where, like you're saying, systemic. It's it's you wonder if it's if not just plain ignorance, but there's a. I mean, it, this we could talk for hours about this, but I'll just say very briefly. Like, there's also in terms of a lack of general knowledge, there's also a lack of transparency and accountability for when they do get it wrong, and they do have it pointed out. And instead of saying, "Hey, you know, we got that wrong, and we'll do better," it's, it's very often to not even acknowledge it, and to sometimes not even print a correction or an editor's note. Yeah. They just let it stay. Like so. Very briefly with the Katie Kirk thing, she was you know, dead to rights. She selectively edited. She was dishonest. And rather than apologize or anything, you know, her and her producers came out and you know, we did it. This is work we're proud of, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like it's a lack of ability to learn, but also a total lack of humility that goes often hand in hand with the bad report. Yeah. And in, in her case as well, the producers on that documentary, uh, this is from a documentary called, I believe it was what, Guns Down. Um Something like I don't that. Remember uh, what it was called. I can't. She did a series of documentaries, and there were actually issues with the other uh, food-based documentary she did before that. Similar issues. Um, I broke all these stories, by the way. Yeah, I remember <laughs> the day, but uh, you know, and then I can give you another recent example too. Politico uh, was reporting on um, the uh, Undetectable Firearms Act getting renewed as part of uh, one of the recent legislative packages that was passed because it had would have expired otherwise. And they reported on it as, you know, a ghost gun ban or a ban on uh, unserialized firearms being uh, passed. But that's, they're two completely separate policies that don't do even close to the same thing. Renewing the Undetectable Firearms Act just keeps the status quo the way it mm -hmm. is because that has just been around say. for a long That's about, basically, it's a law from, really, from, I believe from the 80s that was about making sure that there's enough metal in a gun for it to set off a metal detector. That's, that's what that law does. Um, and then, you know, banning unserialized guns, well, that would be a, a radical departure from current policy. Um, it would basically ban all homemade firearms um, and isn't something that exists. At the, I mean, there's proposals for it. Some states have done this, but you get the idea. They're, they're completely different policies. And Politico had reported on the, this win for Democrats by having this ghost gun ban put in and I, which, which like surprised me. Cause I was like, wait, what there's, what, you, what happened? <laughs> there's some brand new gun bill got passed that I was never, no one talked about until right now. And I thought that they'd probably made this mistake, but they hadn't, this is another classic reporter thing where you don't actually link back to like the text of something that happens way too often in our industry. Yeah. Way too court so court rulings or the text of bills and stuff. Right. Like, Jesus, just give me a link so I can go. <laughs> I want to make sure you what you're saying is right. Um, no, I'd like to see the source material. It's very there's a link to all that stuff in our reports. It's a big emphasis of mine. But hey, regardless, you know, so I tracked this down through my own sources and yeah, figured out, oh, no, they're talking about the Undetectable Firearms Act, not uh, a ghost gun ban or something of that nature on unserialized gun ban right and uh and like i told like i repeatedly um tweeted at them about this and no, no one ever responded or changed anything and i believe if you still go you go look they just have the wrong information um the language of the report never got amended uh, yeah as far as i know um i uh, they never changed anything. And now, readers are, are, and now, politicos readers are worse off for a single yeah. report. 
So it's like, um, again, it's happened. And they are, t- I know people know and hear this. I don't understand why there's not a bigger change to, to get it right. And then I'll say too, that going back to the Katie Couric example, this isn't just like about credibility either. It can be legal uh, issues that you run into if you don't know what you're doing when you're, when you're right. pouring on firearms. Because un- another thing that Katie Couric's producers did on that documentary is that they cross state lines to buy um, handguns from private sellers uh, to show that it was like um, they were trying. This is a common thing that happens. This happens every couple of years. A reporter will go out and try to show that the gun laws are too loose, essentially. And what they actually end up doing is breaking them and committing felonies. <laughs> um, you know, the fa- I think the most famous example of this and one that I also use is um David Gregory, a Meet the Press, when he was interviewing Wayne LaPierre after the, the Sandy Hook shooting, he pulled out a 30-round magazine um, like this, like I'm doing right now here. And he said, why should these be legal? Um, uh, the difference between me doing it right now and when he did it is that right now I'm in Virginia, where these are currently legal. And he was in Washington, D.C., where they were not legal uh, to to possess. Sorry, I dropped my magazine. <laughs> um, but uh, and yeah, so that that's a crime that he committed live on national television that there was actually a police affidavit written up for his arrest. Um, now, he never was arrested. And this this is also a common thing that happens uh, in these cases. Reporters are often given leniency for accidentally breaking laws. Um, there was there's one in uh, that I had reported on as well, uh, in addition to the correct one where a CBS reporter for some they were trying to show that it's easy to for somebody without a like a normal person the cbs reporter who doesn't have a criminal record apparently uh, or any sort of disqualifying records to own a gun it was they were trying to show that it was easy to go in and buy the gun and leave the same day for an ar-15 they did this in alexandria virginia which at a local uh, one of my local gun stores at the time um but for some reason they did this undercover and they didn't tell the gun store what they were doing and so they lied to the gun store. They lied to the licensed dealer about why they were buying this gun and who it was really for. Because at the end of the report, they're like, oh, that she didn't keep this gun. She gave it away uh, and had it disposed of by a third party, which, you know, is a straw purchase. That's that's like the it wasn't actually for her. She wasn't the actual buyer. Uh, and that's a huge problem. And she got reported to the ATF for that after I asked the gun store about what had happened. And so there's a there's like there's yes there's a credibility issue with not having base level information about firearms when you're going to report on it. There's also like a legal issue if you you might like reporters have continually broken the law because they don't understand it when they go to do these stories. Right, and it's, it also has a knock on effect in terms of like you're saying credibility and trust. They're like, well, who who are you writing for? Who are you reporting for? You're reporting for the public. You're doing it for the public interest, and you probably wouldn't be surprised at all. So when we do range day at the NJC, we work with a couple of different, we've worked now with three different ranges and every single time I contact them kind of out of the blue, introduce myself and explain to them that I want to bring a group of journalists to their range. Every single time they kind of back away slowly. And yep. you know, there's yep. a very sort of clear, are you trying to screw me? You're trying and to that screw CBS me right now, aren't report you? gives you an example of why people feel that and way. And like, that's the thing. I don't blame them. I like, I, there's no part of me who was like, hey, man. I was like, yeah, no, I get it. I 100% get it. You have been trained at this point to expect that if a reporter comes calling, you think I'm trying to screw you. And in fact, one of them, um, I'll just, we'll just speak of them anonymously. One of the ranges, they kind of confided in me. Every time there's a major shooting in the DMV area, for your, your viewers, the DMV area being the district, Maryland, and Virginia. Every time there's a major shooting, reporters come to them and ask, did you sell the gun? Did you sell the ammo? Every single time. And they're like, we had nothing to do with this, but we're asked it every single time. So yes, when you call us and say you want to bring you know, 20 journalists onto our shooting range, like I, I don't think so. But no, none of them have ever barred us, luckily. Um, I've always explained exactly what we're trying to do. And every single one we've paired with has been fantastic. I've been very pleased. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think, but that's something you have to do to build trust with any, anyone in the firearms industry when you're trying to report on, because, because there is a very negative association with the industry um, between, you know, the firearms industry and the news industry. And often because, you know, a lot of reporters treat them as adversarial off the bat. 
Um, no, you know, not everyone in the firearms industry is a good guy, right? Uh, like I'm not saying that, but you shouldn't go in necessarily with the, this attitude of like, they're doing that, that you know think back to that cbs report like what are you even trying to show in there that's what didn't make right a lot it's, of sense it's like those weird viral videos you see every now and then of people just kind of harassing you know like fast food workers and like what are you trying to prove right this guy's just doing his job he's not doing anything wrong like you have a beef with something bigger than this person who's just doing their job and like just living their life right and like i remember seeing that i was like that cbs report is like the takeaway is i a law-abiding citizen can legally purchase a firearm in america right. and i was like yeah right. okay you can also buy a car if you yeah, like. Just, I mean, you can do it quickly. Was sort of the point of the report, I guess, is what well, I was just trying to know. what I seemed to be getting it. across. But that's the whole point of the system. It's supposed and, to be instant. And that's this is the larger it. point that's that to them, this was all news. The news was news to the newsmen, which is, I mean, try untangling right. that. That's a little bit of Joseph Heller right there. But like the fact that they exactly. didn't know this, that's actually an indictment on on your industry right now. You're not proving anything to the readers. All you're proving is your own ignorance, which. Sure, if you want to do that, but not in the news industry. The one thing you need is credibility and trust. And if you throw away story after story and then refuse to learn from the same mistakes, you have no one to blame for yourself. You can get mad that people are flocking to Joe Rogan for their news, but you know they're leaving for a reason. It's not completely in a vacuum. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair criticism. I, I just, you know, it's unfortunate. And, and to do it the way they did it undercover, like why you could have, if their point was, you can buy the, this is all perfectly legal to do. And you can walk out with a gun quickly because the background check came back fast. Um, and, and some people want waiting periods or something like there's obviously debates. You can legitimate discussions of policy that exist. There are people on either side that have different points of view and you can explain all that. Uh, if you know what you're talking about, right. You'd be a much better story that way. If you actually knew what you're talking about, you could get people who are representative of either side or, or of these different positions on how this gun buying should work in America or whatever, um, you'd end up with a much better story that doesn't have the ATF call <laughs> on you. Uh, and who knows what happened after that? I, I, they didn't send her to jail as far as I'm aware, but uh, I'm sure it wasn't a pleasant experience for this reporter. And um, yeah, I mean, this is, so this is the other half of it. It's like, you want to learn these things because you want to be credible for your audience and you don't want to misinform them, but also like, <laughs> Gun laws are serious, and if you violate them, you might end up having to go down to talk to ATF agents about why you did something. Right, and so then you that's... accidentally prove the opposite of your point, which is it's too easy yeah. to do this. I'm like, no, right. they take this stuff pretty seriously, which is kind of contra the entire so, you know, narrative that gets pushed with that, like that CBS story. Hmm. Uh, so, what you know, as far as things stand today, you know, you're you're. Uh, somebody running a program where you're trying to bring up the next generation of, of reporters here and trying to give them uh, a good start into the industry. Wh where do you, um, where do you see this all going? Which, what, what are you hoping for to come out of, you know, this, this range day program we're doing? Um, what, what's your view of the future here? I mean, I, I, I feel like I'm almost bipolar and that I, I have good days and bad days in terms of like, you know, this industry is, you know, we're going to, we're going to put it back together where it's on the upswing. And then there's some days where it's like, you know, a lot of this feels pretty irreparable. Like it's just a mess, uh, especially after reading like that, that NPR report, um, just about how entrenched certain sort of how political activists tend to join journalism more and more numbers, where at least people feel more emboldened to get into political activism while being a reporter. Where do I see this going? Like, if there is going to be any sort of long-term effect from what I'm doing, I probably won't be alive for it. Uh, but the idea is just one person at a time, just if I can get, you know, a, two classes every year, just a little more familiar with this topic, that that can actually have a knock-on effect where, look, maybe the editors at the Post or the Times don't know anything about this, but this one person on the desk does know something about it and they can catch it before it goes to print. You can actually have effective trustworthy, credible news reporting. So you know, the idea being that polity is better informed, you can actually have informed debates about these things going forward. So you're not just, you know, you have David Hogg screaming something completely unintelligible about bump stocks at Wayne LaPierre and like nothing's, nothing's happening. It's just people yelling and fundraising off of each other. And meanwhile, people like me who just want to be left alone and, and have a second amendment sort of protected and respected, that's all kind of just fodder in a larger cultural war battle. What I want is for informed reporters so we can get more away from the sort of culture war side of things and get towards 
legislating reasonably and realistically to sort of address some of these issues. If that doesn't sound too big, mm. but that's that's what I got. <laughs> no, no, that's great. Um, and yeah, and I think if we could have more people just learning basics. I mean, I, I will say my experience with a lot of major media uh, reporters from you know the largest outlets out there, uh, I do get, I have traditionally gotten a lot of questions from them trying where they're trying to make sure that they're accurate on it. This is obviously I'm one person and, and you're one person and we can't, <laughs> we can't be the, uh, the ombudsman on guns for the entire industry or whatever. It's not realistic. That's, that's right? a good sign I, though. Right? You got people just yeah, like, yeah. Hey, look, I don't want to make a fool of myself. So can you from every outlet that's fantastic. You know, and, and all the, all the major outlets across the board times, the post, the NBC, you know, wherever. And obviously CNN has hired me to be a contributor and I do also help whenever there's questions on stories there. Um, you know, but again, so there is that desire. I think I, I still feel among the, your, your beat reporters, your, your uh, print reporters, your, your you know, folks gathering news to try and get things right as much as they possibly can. They don't want to misinform their audience. Right. It's just a lack of knowledge usually is the problem or, uh, or a lack of variety in sourcing is another issue too, right? Like they hear from one side and not the other so much, or they, they hear from the reasonable representatives of one side and the crazy representatives or not, you know what I mean? Like there's, you got to search out and try and find, uh, people to, to source from too, to try and get, uh, representative views so that you can inform your audience again. But it all goes down to that at the end of the day. You, you don't want to try and manipulate your audience. You want to try and inform them. You don't want to misinform them. That's that should be your goal. As a right. Like what's the old saying is like, don't attribute malice to that, which can be explained by plain ignorance. I I, I don't <laughs> think many reporters are actively trying to get their reporting wrong. I think a lot of it's just plain ignorance. And part of what I hope to accomplish, you know, pairing up with you is we can start sending off to newsrooms across the country, just one at a time with each new class, somebody, at least somebody on the news desk will actually know. Hey, by the way, no, you can't buy a fully automatic AR-15. And AR doesn't mean assault rifle. Just very yeah, basic right. stuff. Very basic. Well, you start you there and we can build up. Expensive. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you um, can, but good luck. You have to take out a yeah. mortgage on your house. It's a very, yes, $30,000, $30, or whatever. Right. Anyway, um, really appreciate you coming on and give us some, giving us some insight into NJC and into, you know, being here to have this conversation about the program that we're running and, and, you know, maybe people outside of, of NJC will start to adopt the same sort of training and standards to try and bring a bit more knowledge. You know, I've had, I mean, I've, I've taken reporters from the Atlantic to the range for store when they were going to go work on, like, it's not, this isn't something where nobody is interested in this stuff. It's just uh, something that goes beyond teaching one or two reporters here or there. It's an industry-wide issue that uh, needs a more significant response. And I think the first step is what we're doing at NJC, at least we've got some formalized program and hopefully we'll see uh, more of the industry try and, uh, and come up with something similar or adopt our model. I'd be more than happy to share. Um, fine with but, me. Yeah. If people are interested in NJC and want to find out more about it, where, where should they go? Very simple. It's just NJC.com. You can go there, you can apply if you're interested, or if you're interested in learning more about it, you can email me directly. It's just B as in boy. Adams at yaf, Y-A-F dot org. I'd uh, be happy to answer any questions you may have. All right. Fantastic. Uh, if you were interested in learning more about the Reload and buying a membership, uh, you can head over to the reload.com and do that today. You will, of course, get access to hundreds of pieces of analysis that you will not find anywhere else in the world on the Internet or what have you. Uh, you'll also get access to this podcast today early and the opportunity to appear on the show in a member segment. Just respond to your um, your Sunday newsletter that you get as a member is another exclusive, of course. Uh, and, and obviously your, your dues go to making sure we can even do any of this without reload members, the reload would not exist. And so, uh, I really appreciate the support that you give, but it's not just a cherry thing. You also get lots of benefit. So that's all we've got for you guys this week. We will see you again real soon.